Welcome to the Northwestern University Rotating Resident Curriculum in the Department of Emergency Medicine. This is the Obstetrics Gynecology Emergencies Lecture. The goals of this lecture are to learn basic principles of early trimester bleeding. We will discuss the workup of first trimester bleeding and pain, including the importance of ultrasound and quantitative HCG levels in the evaluation. We will also discuss the definition and management of hyperemesis gravidarum. We will explore certain gynecologic causes of abdominal pain, including ovarian torsion and pelvic inflammatory disease. As a generalist physician, the first rule when speaking with consultants is to use language and diction familiar to them. The same is true when discussing cases with an obstetrician gynecologist. With patients being evaluated for first trimester issues, always begin with a G and P system of pregnancy history. G refers to the number of total times the patient has been pregnant, and P refers to the number of children. The TPAL system should be used for the P, as in term, preterm, aborted, and living. Always use a pregnancy wheel after determining the first day of the last menstrual period to establish the exact fetal age. This is extremely important early in pregnancy as differences in days can be clinically important. In patients with first trimester issues, past obstetric history of ectopic pregnancy or in vitro fertilization is extremely important. Additionally, patients with vaginal bleeding should be queried as to the extent of bleeding in terms of number of sanitary pads soaked per hour. Patients with first trimester bleeding will rarely describe pain. Instead, they more often state that they have cramping. This is similar to some patients with myocardial infarctions who claim they don't have pain, just a heavy pressure on their chest. The gynecologic physical examination for patients with first trimester issues is relatively simple. Checking the cervical os, checking for adnexal tenderness or fullness, and checking fetal heart tones. Attention to vital signs and hemodynamics is also important. We will not discuss third trimester bleeding in this lecture because of the highly specialized nature of the evaluation and management of this clinical entity. All such patients should be referred to an obstetrician emergently. Patients with vaginal bleeding in the third trimester should never undergo a digital cervical exam. Patients with vaginal bleeding in the third trimester should not undergo a digital cervical exam in order to avoid causing potentially life-threatening rupture of a placenta previa. Let us discuss a case. A 24-year-old woman, G3P1011, at 8 weeks by dates, presents with intractable nausea and vomiting for 3 days. She has no abdominal pain, fever, chills, diarrhea, or vaginal bleeding. Her physical examination is unremarkable except for dry mucous membranes and a heart rate of 110. Is this simple nausea vomiting of pregnancy, or is this hyperemesis gravidarum? What more information do we need to make the diagnosis? Hyperemesis gravidarum, or HG, is a clinical syndrome with no single agreed-upon agreed definition. A working definition accepted by most OBs is nausea and vomiting with ketonuria and weight loss. It occurs in 1% of all pregnancies. Risk factors for HG include nulliparity and multiple gestation. Interestingly, older age and smoking are protective, but this should not be an indication to encourage your pregnant patients to start smoking to avoid HG. The peak time of onset is at weeks 4 to 10 of pregnancy. Nausea and vomiting that begins for the first time after 10 weeks is unlikely to be HG, and another etiology should be aggressively sought. The typical lab findings include a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis common to most vomiting illnesses. Other findings include low TSH and mild elevations in transaminases and pancreatic enzymes. Importantly, HG does not usually cause abdominal pain, unlike other diagnoses in the differential of nausea and vomiting, suspected with these lab abnormalities. The evaluation of HG should involve excluding other causes of nausea and vomiting, specifically urinary tract infection and intra-abdominal emergencies. Ketonuria without cells is the typical finding seen on urinalysis with HG. Although there is no proven adverse effect of HG on the human fetus, animal data shows that ketonuria does cause fetal damage. Randomized control trials in humans are extremely difficult to accomplish in the obstetric population, and study of HG is no exception. The goal of therapy in HG is to provide dextrose-containing IV fluids so that the ketone bodies formed from decreased oral intake and fatty acid oxidation can be eliminated. Adjunctive therapies include vitamin supplementation and a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. Antiemetics are helpful in reducing the nausea and allowing patients to adequately hydrate orally. Corticosteroids may help to reduce nausea in refractory cases, but should not be used without obstetric consultation. Let us move on to another case. A 23-year-old G1 at 6 and 3 sevenths complains of vaginal bleeding and abdominal cramping. What is the differential diagnosis? What is the proper evaluation and management of this patient with first trimester vaginal bleeding and cramping? 
The differential diagnosis of patients with first trimester bleeding includes physiologic bleeding that occurs in a large percentage of normal pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancy is the important life-threatening diagnosis that must always be considered. Miscarriage is another very common cause of first trimester bleeding. Structural pathologies such as cervical and vaginal anomalies or molar pregnancy and fibroid are less common causes. Every patient with first trimester bleeding should undergo pelvic examination to assess whether the cervical os is open or closed and whether fetal tissue is present. Most patients will also require a pelvic ultrasound and a quantitative HCG level. We will discuss the indications and utility of the ultrasound in the next few slides. A single HCG level is rarely helpful in prognostication. Rather, in the first trimester, most normal pregnancies will have an HCG level that doubles roughly every 48 hours. An HCG level that doubles more slowly than this is indicative of an abnormal pregnancy, either an ectopic or miscarriage. A CBC and type in RH is also helpful in patients with first trimester bleeding. Women who are RH negative with vaginal bleeding during pregnancy will require Rogam therapy to prevent antibody formation to subsequent pregnancies with potentially RH positive fetuses. The primary utility of the ultrasound in the emergency evaluation for first trimester bleeding and pain is to include the major life-threatening diagnosis in the differential, namely ectopic pregnancy. Additional information can be obtained for normal pregnancies such as gestational age, the dates from last menstrual period are probably more accurate in the first trimester, multiple gestation, molar pregnancy, and heterotopic pregnancy. With transvaginal ultrasound, the earliest sonographic finding is the presence of a gestational sac after four weeks followed by a yolk sac at five weeks and a fetal pole with cardiac activity just before six weeks. Spontaneous abortion or miscarriage occurs in 20% of all recognized pregnancies before 20 weeks. It is probably far more common than this as there are felt to be a significant number of unrecognized pregnancies that end in miscarriage. The number one risk factor is maternal age. History of miscarriage is a strong risk factor for future miscarriage. Smoking, ethanol, caffeine, and NSAID use have all been associated with a higher rate. It is important to note, however, that patients with first trimester bleeding where ectopic is ruled out and physical examination is normal have as good of a chance to have a normal delivery as they do of miscarrying. Therefore, always reserve judgment when discussing prognosis with patients in these cases. This is a summary of definitions of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. The terms abortion and miscarriage are used interchangeably in medical language, though there is a push from the OBGYN community to use miscarriage instead of abortion to reduce potential confusion and judgment among patients. Threatened miscarriages are very common. The cervical os is closed, fetal heart tones are present, and there is no fetal tissue passage. Fetal viability is possible after threatened miscarriage. Complete, incomplete, missed, and inevitable miscarriages virtually ensure no fetal viability. Complete miscarriages involve an already passed fetus and closed os, and incomplete involves a partially passed fetus and open os in the midst of aborting. Missed miscarriages mean that the fetus is non-viable, but no tissue has been passed and the uterus has not yet opened. Inevitable miscarriages are similar to missed, except that the os is open. For threatened miscarriage, management is always expectant. Roughly half these patients will go on to have normal deliveries. For all other types of miscarriage, hemodynamically unstable patients are generally taken for urgent DNC. For hemodynamically stable patients, management is on a case-by-case -case basis. The obstetric literature is split on this issue. Some advocate early surgical evacuation and some advocate watchful waiting. Ectopic pregnancy is the most important rule-out diagnosis in the evaluation of first trimester bleeding or pain. It occurs in 2% of all recognized pregnancies. In vitro fertilization increases the risk of both ectopic and heterotopic pregnancy. Heterotopic pregnancy refers to an intrauterine pregnancy with a concomitant ectopic pregnancy. The number one location for an ectopic is in the fallopian tubes. Risk factors include prior ectopic, smoking, and any fallopian tubal pathology including surgery and PID. Symptoms are generally evident after six weeks of gestational age. Ectopic pregnancy is the most common cause of pregnancy-related maternal death in the first trimester. Ectopic pregnancy almost always occurs in the setting of abdominal pain. Any previously healthy woman of childbearing age who presents with syncope, hypotension, and abdominal pain should be presumed to have ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. It is important to note that physical examination in hemodynamically stable patients with ectopic pregnancy may be completely normal. The only way to accurately diagnose most cases of ectopic pregnancy is with pelvic ultrasound. 
the presence of an adnexal mass or the absence of an intrauterine pregnancy with an HCG level greater than 2000 should prompt concern for an ectopic pregnancy in the right clinical setting. The HCG doubling time is usually significantly longer than 48 hours in ectopic pregnancy. As with most other obstetric emergencies, unstable patients with ectopic pregnancy generally require emergent operative management. The goal in the ED setting is to optimize pre-op conditions. Type and cross-matched blood should be ordered, and patients should be aggressively fluid resuscitated with saline through large bore IVs. Stable patients with ectopic pregnancy may be managed medically with methotrexate or surgically based on obstetric consultation. Let us move on to another case. An 18-year-old female presents with lower abdominal pain for three days with vaginal discharge. The pain is steadily getting worse. On further history, you find that the patient has recently had a new sexual partner. She has just had her period, lacks dysuria, frequency, urgency, vomiting, or diarrhea, and is not pregnant. Based on your most likely diagnosis, what do you expect to find on your physical examination? Pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, is a bilateral infection of the upper reproductive tract, specifically the fallopian tubes. It is caused by the ascension of vaginal organisms to the cervix. The most common causes of PID are gonorrhea, chlamydia, and the organisms that cause bacterial vaginosis. Risk factors for PID include multiple sexual partners, a past history of PID, young age, and recent menses. PID is a clinical diagnosis. Labs and imaging are only useful to rule out other diagnoses. PID is characterized by diffuse bilateral lower abdominal and pelvic pain associated with either vaginal bleeding or discharge. Characteristic physical exam findings will be discussed on the next slide. Only half of all patients with PID have fever. Perhaps the most important element of the history is the sexual history, which can never be accurately obtained if the patient is not questioned alone in the exam room. Less than half of all patients with PID have leukocytosis. An ultrasound is indicated in certain cases of PID, which will be discussed on a later slide. Key physical exam findings in PID include cervical motion tenderness, cervical discharge, and adnexal tenderness. Tenderness with even minimal motion of the cervix is considered positive. Adnexal tenderness is usually bilateral in most cases of PID. Unilateral tenderness with other signs and symptoms of PID suggests the presence of a tubo-ovarian abscess, or TOA, and is an indication for pelvic ultrasound. Interestingly, unilateral adnexal tenderness in the absence of PID symptoms and risk factors can be a sign of appendicitis or diverticulitis in the right clinical setting. A low threshold strategy should be employed when considering treatment for PID. Subclinical cases of PID are extremely common, especially with chlamydial disease or when oral contraceptives are being used. The risk of serious sequelae far outweigh the risk of inappropriate antibiotics in most cases. Ceftriaxone and doxycycline are the most common antibiotics used for treatment of PID. It is important to use both antibiotics. The most common mistake in treating PID is failure to treat both gonorrhea and chlamydia. Only one-third of all patients patients are compliant with long courses of antibiotics. Therefore, a one-time azithromycin dose can be used instead of the 10-day course of doxycycline with similar efficacy in patients deemed unlikely to fill prescriptions. Treatment should also involve partner treatment, global STD testing, and risk factor reduction such as barrier precautions. Indications for admission in PID include failure of oral outpatient therapy, social reasons such as a pediatric patient, and tubo-ovarian abscess identified on ultrasound. The intravenous antibiotic regimens are similar to the oral regimens. Clindamycin-containing regimens are highly effective in treating TOA. The sequelae of PID include infertility due to scarring of the fallopian tubes. Clinical severity in no way correlates with pathologic severity of PID. Therefore, even subclinical cases of PID can cause severe fallopian tube scarring and infertility. This is the reason why clinicians should use a low threshold when treating even mild or uncertain PID. Ectopic pregnancy is a well-known complication of PID, also due to fallopian tube scarring. Chronic pelvic pain can occur in up to half of all cases. TOA complicates PID in up to one-third of all inpatient cases. It is usually a polymicrobial infection. Patients with TOA should always be admitted as rupture of TOA causes extremely high mortality. Emergent surgical or IR drainage of the abscess is controversial, and most cases will improve with intravenous antibiotics alone. As stated earlier, clindamycin-containing antibiotic regimens are highly effective for treatment of TOAs. Let us discuss another case. A 23-year-old female presents with acute, severe, spasmodic lower right abdominal pain for six hours. She has severe pain with nausea and vomiting. Her vital signs and physical exam are completely normal when you see her. 
Think about what more history you'd like to obtain. What would be part of your focused physical exam? What is in your differential diagnosis and how will you make the diagnosis? Assume that she has no other symptoms on history and that her physical examination is completely normal. Laboratory work is also normal and pelvic examination is unremarkable. You are getting ready to discharge her when she has another episode of severe pain, doubling over and writhing with vomiting. What is your leading diagnosis now? How would you evaluate this? Ovarian torsion is the most likely diagnosis. Pathophysiology involves twisting of the ovary causing venous backflow and ischemia. The vast majority of torsed ovaries are enlarged, but up to 5% of ovarian torsions occur in normal-sized ovaries. The major risk factors are ovarian enlargement and pregnancy. Infertility is the most important sequela, and patients at risk for torsion should be immediately evaluated for consideration of possible operative repair. The diagnosis of ovarian torsion is extremely difficult to make on clinical grounds alone. Although most patients will exhibit abdominal pain and tenderness, a sizable minority will lack these findings. About a quarter of patients will not have a palpable adnexal mass on physical exam. Peritoneal signs occur in only a small proportion of patients with torsion. Although ultrasound can demonstrate decreased arterial blood flow and ovarian enlargement, a negative ultrasound in a patient at high risk for torsion cannot rule out the diagnosis. CT scan is not a useful study to rule in or out torsion, can only provide information on ovarian size, and may result in substantial delays to diagnosis, which can lead to devastating complications. The treatment of ovarian torsion is surgical. Operative detorsion rather than oophorectomy may result in ovarian salvage in early torsion. Remember again that ultrasound may be equivocal in some cases of subsequently proven torsion. Patients who are at high risk for torsion should be considered for diagnostic laparoscopy to prove the absence of torsion despite the absence of abnormal ultrasound findings. Let us do another case. A 34-year-old woman who is three weeks status post normal spontaneous vaginal delivery presents with shortness of breath. Her vitals are listed above. What more history do you want to elicit? What is in your differential diagnosis? The exam shows tachycardia, the presence of an S3 gallop, bilateral crackles, and 2-plus pitting edema. What is the most likely diagnosis now, and what is your management plan? The patient has evidence of acute heart failure due likely to peripartum cardiomyopathy. PPCM is a dilated cardiomyopathy that occurs any time from one month prepartum to five months postpartum. Ejection fraction is less than 50%, and mortality correlates with lower EF. To diagnose PPCM, no other cause of the acute heart failure can be found, and patients cannot have cardiac disease before pregnancy. Women of sub-Saharan African descent are at highest risk. The etiology of PPCM is unknown but postulated to be immune-mediated. Risk factors include older age, multiparity, multiple gestation, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and cocaine use. PPCM is evaluated and treated in a manner similar to other acute heart failure exacerbations, with a few exceptions. Attention to ABCs, focusing on maintenance of oxygenation and relief of respiratory distress, is paramount. Nitrates and loop diuretics, like with other causes of acute heart failure, are integral components of therapy. Due to a significantly higher thrombophilic state, PPCM patients require systemic anticoagulation more often than patients with other causes of acute heart failure. Digoxin may be used in the acute setting to promote improved ejection fraction. Hydralazine is one of the few antihypertensives that may be safely and effectively used in pregnant patients. For severe cases, IVIG and even cardiac transplantation may be required. Mortality of PPCM is about 20%. Once a patient develops PPCM and recovers, she should be counseled not to get pregnant again to avoid another episode of PPCM. Here is the summary of OBGYN emergencies. Learn OBEs. It will help your consultation interactions. Regarding first trimester pain and bleeding, bleeding may be physiologic, so reserve judgment on gestational prognosis. The goal of evaluation of first trimester pain or bleeding is to rule out the life-threatening cause, i.e. the ectopic pregnancy. If there is a decent chance of pelvic inflammatory disease, treat first and ask questions later. Ovarian torsion is a difficult diagnosis to make clinically. When in doubt, ultrasound, and if high enough clinical suspicion, consider a gynecologic consultation to evaluate laparoscopically. Treat peripartum cardiomyopathy like a typical acute heart failure patient, but consider adding systemic anticoagulation due to the increased thrombophilic state.